Welcome, and thank you for joining us for our Exploring Next Generation Education webinar series. I'm Hiller Spires, Executive Director at the Friday Institute for Educational Innovation in the College of Education here at North Carolina State University. And I'm your host for today's conversation with North Carolina poet laureate Jackie Shelton Green. As educators are confronted with the pandemic, a divided nation, and renewed focus on racial injustices across our country, we're being called on to think differently about how we serve and educate students. Through this webinar series, we're asking the question, can we use our crisis context to think futuristically about education and about the needs of each learner? Americans, especially white Americans, are undergoing a rapid education on the burdens black, brown, and indigenous people carry every day. This education is ongoing as we seek ways to take individual and collective action to become anti-racist. We're delighted that Jackie Shelton Green has joined us today. Jackie, I'm gonna take a minute and brag on you if that's okay. Jackie is the first African-American and third woman to be appointed as the North Carolina Poet Laureate. When he appointed her in 2018, Governor Cooper stated that, and I quote, Jackie Shelton Green brings a deep appreciation of our state's diverse communities to her role as an ambassador of North Carolina literature. Jackie's appointment is a wonderful new chapter in North Carolina's rich literary history. And Jackie, I understand that you were also recently named the 2021 Frank B. Haynes Writer in residence at UNC Chapel Hill. And we congratulate you for that among your many other accomplishments. Um, you know, when I first encountered your work, it was about a year ago, I was struck by the soulfulness and authentic authenticity of your poetry, your voice within your poetry. Can you share with the audience a little bit about what first led you to poetry? Thank you, Hiller, and thank you to the community that has gathered uh, for, for this conversation. I'm really happy that you're all here. I started writing when I was very, very young, growing up in rural Orange County, North Carolina. I lived in a community that was hinged by two churches side by side, an African Methodist Episcopal Church and a holiness church. And it was that community, it is that community that raised me. And I would like to say continues to raise me as I bear witness to all of our celebrations, um, revolutions as a, and I do use this word revolution, revolutions as a community in terms of all the children that we birthed and schooled and sent out into the world, just as the community sent me out into the world. But it was my grandmother who instilled in me the importance of reading and writing and that goes back to her story, a story that I will indulge you, and I'll ask you to indulge, uh, indulge me to tell you. My grandmother's grandmother was the property of the slave master that enslaved our family. My grandmother's grandmother was specifically the property of her half three-year-old sister. She indeed was the child of the white man who owned her. My grandmother's grandmother had been warned consistently to stay out of the missus way. The white woman did not like this child for obvious reasons. The woman had always wanted to sell this child, but her husband would never allow that since this was his blood child. The white children, her half siblings, secretly taught my grandmother's grandmother how to read and write. The white woman was very, very adamant about her children's education. And on a daily basis, she gathered with them to do their lessons. On a particular day, because my grandmother's duty was to always be in the presence of her three-year-old sister, 
making sure she was fed, clothed, and taken care of. My grandmother's grandmother was in a room where the white mother was teaching her children a lesson. The child that was called upon had forgotten the answer. But the children knew that my grandmother's grandmother knew the, the answer. And because they were children and did not understand the consequences, they all stared at my grandmother's grandmother, who was nine years old, older than the rest of them. My grandmother's grandmother blurted out the correct answer. On that day, it was discovered that this slave child could read and write. On that day, my grandmother's grandmother was beaten severely, banned from the big plantation house and sent to live at the edge of the plantation with an old slave woman who had really outlived her service. She was just waiting to die. The white woman now has her wish. My grandmother's grandmother has been sold to a plantation in a neighboring county. On the morning that the neighbor comes to carry my grandmother's grandmother away, my grandmother's grandmother's mother is running behind this old buck wagon that is going fast through the dust and an old rusty nail falls to the ground. My grandmother's grandmother's, my grandmother's grandmother's mother picks up the nail, puts it in her pocket, and she keeps the nail. My grandmother would tell me the story over and over again. Many years later, my grandmother's grandmother's mother would buy her child out of slavery. That nail has been passed down on the matrilineal side of my family for generations. I now have that nail. My grandmother told me that she told me the story over and over again because someone who looked just like me nearly lost their life because they could read and write. She said, this is your job. This is what you must do, granddaughter. Your job is to tell, simply to tell. Tell the stories, tell the stories, tell this story. So education loomed large in my family. My grandmother would give me journals because I was a busybody, nosy little girl in church and she would give me journals to keep me quiet and I would sit and write about all that was happening around me on Sunday mornings. So that's what started my journey to writing. My grandmother, you know, and you know, when you're six years old, your little book might be four letters because you know every page, the letter is as big as the page. But I thought I was writing books. And I wrote many books sitting in that church as a child. That is my early beginning, a very humble early beginning, but a very powerful story that informs me that what we keep does keep us. That nail has instructed, directed, <clears throat> excuse me, informed my life's journey as a creative artist, as a creative practitioner, as a creative activist as an art activist, one who understands the power of story. Well, what a powerful story and what a powerful cultural heritage that supports you now in your role as North Carolina Poet Laureate. Um, I remember uh, a quote by Nikki Giovanni and she said that writers write from empathy. And you clearly have many experiences that you're drawing from already for, for your writing. How does her quote resonate with you? Or does it? Um, it does. I think it's one of the many, many containers that we write out of. Mm -hmm. uh, as a documentary poet, I, I use poetry as a container um, to document current and historical events as well as for commemoration, resistance, uh, and possibility. So yes, I, I'm always empathetic in my writing. And I think, well, I know that what I have put in place for myself as a barometer or as a measuring stick of when am I being effective is when everyone in the room sees themselves, hears themselves inside of my poetry or my story. You know, it's not enough for me to write a poem at, and be standing at a podium 
And the only people in the room who understand the poem are women. Or the only people in the room who understand the poem are Southern women. Or the only women who might understand it are Black women. Or the only people who might understand it are Southerners. What is the human connection? What is that cord that connects us in our humanity? And when the, the lone white guy in the back is nodding his head because he gets it, I feel accomplished because that is my goal is to, is to, write, is, is to write about what connects us in our humanity and in the humanities, which is very, very important. Thank you. I think that's a powerful message that you have of wanting to see what connects us through our humanity. And um, I think it's interesting that your, your message and your goal for your message is for it to be for everyone. And I was wondering, as you think about being North Carolina Poet Laureate, because it's, um, it's, a, it's an honor indeed, this position, what else do you hope to communicate um, in your role, especially during this challenging year that we're all experiencing? The two words that come up for me are reflection and opportunity. Hmm. You know, this virus and everything that's happening to us as a society has created an amazing landscape and it's also a new portal a, a new portal, the universe has given us this tremendous portal. And we have to make some decisions about who we might be beyond COVID, who we might be beyond last Tuesday. And we can go through this new portal dragging all of our old stuff, all of our baggage of racism and classism and homophobia, ageism, everything sexism, we can drag it all with us, or we can go through naked starting to think about how we reimagine ourselves. So our children actually might start feeling safe and, and being given the opportunity for our children to stand up in their truths. As I travel across the state of North Carolina, uh, as a poet and a poet laureate who has always envisioned community building and a larger scope. It has been my goal to take the laureateship off of a lofty kind of pedestal. Poetry needs to be accessible, is accessible to everyone. So my goal, my duty, my mission for myself has always been to think about how I empower community people to tell their stories across the state of North Carolina. That those people might be factory workers who are saying, well, Ms. Shelton Green, nobody wants to hear my story. I just work in a factory or I never finished eighth grade. But to validate the worthiness of all of us as citizen, as literary citizens, we're all literary citizens and literary citizenship has to be empowered. It has always been the artists, the writers, the dancers, the sculptors, the musicians who have held us accountable and who help us through times like these. Um, so that's my goal. You know, before March, I was all over the state of North Carolina. And I actually, I, I, I looked at my spreadsheet the other day from July, now from August, 2018 up until now, I have actually been to over 500 sites or in, interacted with 500 communities or spoken at colleges, public schools, private schools. And I work that hard because it is what is required of me. It's what I require of myself. It may not be what has been required of my wonderful colleagues who are all dear friends, but it is required of me because I see people, too many people who look like me inside of this journey, whose stories have been disenfranchised, have been muted, often erased, and sometimes reinvented. So I have a voice to, to lift up all the citizens of North Carolina in their beautiful 
and not so beautiful, but inside of stories that we all need to know. Thank you. <clears throat> um, that really resonates with me, your, your mission to lift up voices and help people share their voices, especially voices that may have been erased in the past. <clears throat> um, on Juneteenth, 2020, you released your first LP poetry album, and it was called The River Speaks of Thirst, produced by Soul City Sounds and Clearly Records. And I think that's probably one of the goals of, of uh, that album was to lift up others' voices as well. And you read one of your poems on the album and it was called, Oh My Brother. And this, is, this poem is related to racial injustice and specifically the death of George Floyd and so many more people of color who came before him and who now have come after him. I was wondering if you would share a few words and introduce the video for us because we're gonna play that video for our audience. Thank you so much, Hiller. Many years ago before George Floyd's murder, I was invited by a group of poets um, who had created a project called Poetry of Lamentation. So they called me and asked me would I consider joining this project? And they explained to me that due to the fact that so many men and women were being killed at the hands of police on a daily basis, that we could almost count on within 24 to 48 hours, there would be another name, another body, another person added to the heap. I agreed. And when I hung up the phone, I remember walking through my house and nearly falling on my face because I realized I was waiting for someone to die. That in order to write this poem, someone would die. Within 24 hours, I had my person. It was a link, not a full news story. Um, it was just a le less than 30 second TV bite that said unidentified African-American male murdered en route for something, something in a place in Michigan I'd never heard of. More news, more news on the six o'clock news. That was it. I had nothing to, to, to characterize this, this person with. So, oh, my brother, my brother, I thought about my brother, my husband, my sons all the men that I know. And I wrote this poem because I needed to provide agency uh, to this unidentified person. So that is the beginning. That is what the poem is about. And it does include many, many other people that you will see. Thank you. So we'll watch the video now. Oh, my brother. For Eric Garner, Trayvon Martin, nameless brothers, all of my brothers who have been silenced. Oh, my brother, my brother, I will weep for you whenever the sun rises or falls. Your shadow has been betrayed. The red of the bullet bleeds and covers every breath of all the life you've lived. Oh, my brother, my brother, I will stand here and wail your name. Hold the bullet inside my mouth that cannot stop convulsing with pain. I will learn to swallow the spasms in your screams. I am calling my brothers and my sisters to the ground beside this river where your blood is born, where your blood runs until it is clear, until its red is spent, and it stands up like the wind and speaks into a light 
we cannot name. Oh, my brother, my brother, I beat my chest, pierce my hands, run back and forth naked in rain, trying to swallow this red of a bullet that knew your name, cracked open your smile, stole your hair. Oh, my brother, I weep for all I do not know about you. I weep with the bullet that is lodged in my throat, whispering its own requiem. The red of the bullet cries out your name. The bullet whispers to me about the flowers that heard the sound. The bullet whispers to me about the sorcery of forgiveness. The bullet whispers to me about black flies stirring the ground beneath your feet. Oh, my brother, my brother, who will wash your feet, save the sand inside your shoes? Oh, my brother, where is your mother, your father, who will help me scrape the dried blood that blocks the doorway of your heart? I want to be the water, the sweet oils that rub into the skin of you. I want to hold your bones steady so your mother can identify your face. Rub the soft earlobes she's kissed a thousand times. Oh, my brother, how must we hold your lover who wants a redemption for your skin, who searches for your lips in the dark? Oh, my brother, there is so much blood falling from the sky today, suffocating the light, suffocating the babies. I will guard your roadkill blood. If necessary, I will chew the bullet and digest metallic contradiction. I will be the shovel and the crib. I will sing your name into the wind. I will sing your name until the wind lifts it from my tongue and sings your legacy into the 10th degree of sound. I will wail the presence of your history through this throat that is out of rhythm. We be poets, the daughters of your winters and sons of your summers. We be ancient scribes, the architects of your sweat and your tears. My poems will be forever screaming the life of you. I dare the red of the bullet to forget. I dare the killer of you to remember. My words are the acid erasing the crime scene. My words are the softness of all the evidence of ghost hidden beneath your shirt, inside your underwear, hungry ghost, casting your name into rivers. Oh, my brother, oh, my brother, oh, my brother. What are the ancestors singing? Oh, my brother, you don't have to behave in your grave. Oh, my brother, call me and these lyrics will gather arms, stage your rebellion. The red of the bullet has the poetry of your spirit embedded with indelible ink. Oh, my brother, my brother, hear the wail of the red of the bullet. Hear the space between your ribs crumble. Hear the sounds in your chest become a roaring ocean. Hear the butterflies cease flying. Hear this silence that will not be quiet.
Thank you. Hear the silence that will not be quiet. Very powerful. What do you hope the poem will do for people during this time we're experiencing in our state and our country? I know when we started the webinar, you mentioned that um, poetry is in some ways an act of violence, uh, act of revolution. How, how can this be help help spur our revolution that's needed? I think right now everyone is looking for new ways to show up new ways to think about being how how are we being right now not how are we doing or what we are doing but just to think about what it means to be and i keep using the word required and i think right now it is required of our humanity to see to open our eyes and to hear with a set of compassionate listening skills not active listening skills, but compassionate listening skills. Listening skills that are not just informing us what we're going to say as soon as the first speaker is speaking, but to compassionately embrace. And I think right now what I want for any of my work and especially this documented piece is to witness, is to bear witness. When we see ourselves in the faces or our children's eyes in the faces of any child who might be suffering, who may be in trouble, perhaps we become more compassionate. You know, I think it was Martin Luther King who said, we came here in different boats, but we're all in this boat together now. And that's truth. So I think that when we can get out of our own way and stop holding on to all of the artificialities of, of materialism and capitalism, and all of the things that we buy to create the sense of security and the sense of this construct called joy. Um, and then we just keep it buying because we never get joy. You know, right now is a time to pause and, and see the joy in a two-year-old, you know, just running through rain puddles or to see the joy in watching a teenage kid help an elder in their yard. This is a tremendous pause. And unfortunately, it is the lives of people that are giving us this pause. You know, um, yeah, yeah. I don't wanna be the writer who is capitalizing on the deaths of my people. So it was very, very hard for me to write this poem. It's been, I've not written a COVID poem. My daughter died in 20, 2009, it took me until 2017 to write a poem about her. So I think that right now is the time that we use all of, all of the art that's available to us and to not be afraid to be afraid, not be afraid to get it wrong, mm -hmm. not be afraid to make the mistakes. But I hope that this video, and I know that this video has spurred many, many conversations, many, many conversations across, across many, many different um, stratas of, of, of our humanity. This video is available, someone just asked in the chat. It's available on, you can Google it, it's on YouTube. It's also, I think, available on my website, JackieSheltonGreen.com. Um, yeah, so thank you for, for receiving for receiving this. Uh, I also want to give a shout out because on the album, I was fortunate enough to ask the poet laureate of Chapel Hill, C.J. Suet, to read one of my poems, No Poetry, which he did. And the amazing vocalist Jennifer Evans sings on one of my poems on the album. And Nina Freelon, our beloved Nina Freelon, um, and I do a call and response to um, the namesake of this album, The River Speaks of Thirst. So I'm very honored to be able to have those collaborations. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I noticed um, at the end of the video, uh, it, th at the end, there's a hashtag and it says, say their names. <clears throat> 
What do you think are some ways, big and everyday ways, that educators, that we as educators can say their names? Well, I think it begins with the children in front of them. They need to learn their names. <laughs> I'm in too many classrooms where teachers will not make the effort to pronounce children's names. And when you don't make the effort to understand the power of naming, what it means to be named, what naming, you know, what it means and, and to help children understand the power of, of their names. To me, it's very reckless because it also is a statement that you don't really see that child or value that child's humanity. And regretfully, I have traveled the state and witnessed many, many things that have made me very sad and just placed me in a place of, of sorrow, witnessing the negligence of some teachers. And that, that, that's, that's not by and large. You know, I see But I have witnessed upfront and personal the child who is not seen mm -hmm. and the child who the other children will tell me when I say, well, why is Marcus not joining us? Oh, but well, the teacher just lets him stay over there and play because he doesn't, he doesn't know how to do anything. She just lets him stay over there in the corner. Mm -hmm. To see this happening and some of our more prominent, more prosperous school systems. It shouldn't happen in any school system. But where I was, I was truly shocked. Yeah. Um, and I, I could just call that out. And I won't. But mm -hmm. I think, you know, saying their names is how do we, again, if you do a poll right now of just citizens on a street and name some of these names, many people will have no idea who you're talking about. Because even when we see on the TV we didn't just see someone murdered in broad daylight. We didn't see someone murdering for the camera. This is the first time I've ever witnessed a murder, a recorded murder. And yet we all do not see this or interpret this in the same way. So I think teachers have to be real. They have to be truth tellers. They have to find the creativity, the innovation, in order to teach the things that have to be taught that are hard to teach. And we have to teach the child who is hard to teach and not give up on that child. So I, I've seen very creative ways that teachers have actually brought what is happening to us into the classroom to talk about it, to create the balance in a very diverse classroom. But recently I received an email about a young friend who's a mother in California. She just relocated from North Carolina. And even in homeschooling, I mean, sitting at home with the child on the screen, children are not always safe. The woman mother accounts that her child and a number of child children were very offended because there were political characters that kept popping up on other children's tablets and just like they were totally distracted and were and just felt it was horrible. Mm -hmm. And the teacher did not become a gatekeeper in that way, did not, you know, did not just stop and say, okay, we're not, we're not gonna do this. Um, and the parent went on to talk about how some parents would just beside themselves that this was allowed to happen. And the teachers saw that it wasn't wrong, that there was nothing wrong with it. But if you are a certain child who feels unsafe in the presence of, of certain figures, then that should be taken into account as an educator. So I think the question right now is, how do we create and organize the infrastructures for us to build citizen power to transform practices and to dismantle systems of harm mm -hmm. as educators. Um, you know, how do we bring attention to the needs of 
marginalized children? How do we amplify how they can grow up not only to be healthy and educated, but how they go on to be amazing, powerful leaders and, and agents of change? I think that is as important as the core curricular values. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> that was going to be my next question. So you got ahead. You got ahead of me um, because you've taught in so many venues with so many different groups of writers. You've taught with elementary age students, incarcerated women, adults in higher education. You've really um, engaged so many different different people, especially here in North Carolina. And I, I think your message of uh, teachers now, educators taking responsibility and making sure that we create the conditions for especially with our marginalized students to see themselves in new ways within the educational system and to provide, as you say, the infrastructure to make that happen. I mean, what a powerful agenda. And I, I love that that agenda came from a poet. So thank you very much for those words. Um, you're writing and leading the literary arts in North Carolina in the age of increasing racialized violence, as you described in Oh My Brother. You know, at the same time, our country has just elected the first female vice president who is Black and Indian. What did it mean to you as Kamala Harris made history last week? Well... <laughs> I always come back to the word possibility. And as a brown, black, dark child growing up in the rural South, I always knew I could be anything and everything that I wanted to be because I had, I had a force of community, a force of family, a force of, of educators. I grew up in a segregated school system. I had a force of people telling me I was the baddest ass little thing in the world. And I knew that. So to see Kamala Harris step forth, you know, um, it's a moment to, to, to cherish, to honor, and to, again, hold up in front of our children, you know, um, to be seen, to see people who look like them. Uh, I remember that, that poignant photograph of the little girl in the museum standing in front of Michelle Obama. I also remember countless black women bringing teenage daughters to my poetry readings, standing in tears saying, we don't know you, but our daughters have to be here to witness you. And what I always say to these young kids, and I'm sure that this is what uh, Vice President Elette Harris is saying, you are worthy, you are worthy and we see you and you know, your worthiness is all that you need to remember. So, you know, it's a time of reckoning. It's, it's a time when, when, you know, this comes back to educators. I also think it comes back to a time when we need more and more educators in school systems who look like, who look like the child citizen that they're teaching. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate to grow up in a segregated school system first grade through eighth grade, where all the teachers lived in the community. We worshiped together, we played together, we had fun together, there were celebrations and we grieved together, you know? Um, and for many, many reasons, we don't have that anymore, but I am foolish enough to believe that we still have the capacity to build community inside of our schools. Mm -hmm. And what I'm witnessing, uh, in school systems is how teachers are doing this, how they're reimagining more equitable and more resilient educational practices, if that makes sense. It does make sense, absolutely. Um, last night, I was listening to Stacey Abrams on TV and she made the comment, you cannot be what you cannot see. And I think that's what you're speaking about. Um, and we know that we need more people of color in the teaching profession. And it's so imperative 
for our children to see themselves in, in the teachers. So um, I think that is one of our great challenges of education right now. Is right. To... I mean, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, and go ahead. Part of that is, is not to idolize people who make it. And again, making them unattainable. Mm -hmm. And that's why when I'm traveling across the state of North Carolina, I'm telling young children, I'm just like you. I grew up in rural North Carolina. I am sure that what your parent told you this morning, walking out the door is the same thing my parents said to me every day going to school. You know, you can do this. There's nothing magical about me. There's absolutely nothing magical about a Kamala Harris. It's called work. It's called having goals. It's called setting goals. It's called finding the people that are going to support you and get and help to get you where you need to go. Mm-hmm. And that sometimes is just family. Right. So I, I think that one of the things that our culture does um, is we make movie stars, you know, we fetish, we make everybody a fetish and, and we have to stop that. And we, those of us who are in positions where people are looking up, we have to remember that we're not magical. And that comes back to how do we share just basic, basic human concepts that, that bring us all to the center and connect. Right. I'm gonna ask uh, one more question and then we're gonna open it up for the audience to ask some questions. Um, You've already touched on this a little bit, but I'd love to hear your thoughts in in a summary fashion. So what is the most important thing you would like to tell educators to keep in mind as we navigate the challenges before us? What is it that educators need to understand moving forward? Well, there are many things, but I think one of the things is that educators themselves are taking care of themselves. It's very important that educators right now are loved, that they too are seen, they are celebrated. And also it's important that they really see their children, you know, not as little people just sitting on a screen, but actually knowing who they are, not making the mistakes of some educators who've done in other places by calling the police on children because they see a play gun in the room and and don't explore that any further than calling the police. But right now, it's a wonderful time for educators to think out of the box, to become the creative makers that I know they are. And what children need now more than anything is love and to feel protected and safe. Mm. I'm talking to a lot of children. I teach a class, a weekly class of a group of students in Saudi Arabia. And what comes out in their poetry most is fear. I'm working with a group of kids in a Montessori school in the mountains on a weekly basis. It's fear. So our children need to feel safe and we need to build a world, create a world that is safe for them. And I don't mean on a large scale, we can do that right where we are. How do teachers right now in addition to everything else they have to do, include perhaps being parents themselves, how do we insert ourselves into a community conversation? Hmm. How do we find out what's even going on in a community? Before we do our curricular, do we sit down in a circle every morning with our students on the screen and do our check-ins? Do we, do we ask them what they did last weekend with grandma on the farm? These conversations are important. They will validate and they will help us through this. Mm-hmm. I don't think that there's anything mind boggling about where we should be right now and what we should be doing. Mm-hmm. But I think if we can just get out of our own way and um, I don't like the word new normal because <laughs> this is not normal. No. I think we can use, this is a newness. It's a new way of being. But I hope that we don't normalize this process. I don't want to be doing this for the rest of my life. I do not want to be meeting people on, on Zoom and a family reunion or at a funeral. 
So how do we help our children face their fears, allow them to express our fears? So right now I think teachers need to hold spaces for themselves that are powerful and life-giving and find some joy and remember that they are practitioners. The teaching is a practice. It's not mm. babysitting, it's a practice. And to ask community, to ask us, to tell us what you need, because we should be required to support you. What do you need from us? And there are many, many models across the country of how community systems, communities have stepped in to answer teachers' questions. So mm -hmm. just remember that you are a community, a stable right. community. And you, you already know that because you have so many associations, but you also right. have people. Yes. And we have a question from ba Bailey Wingler. How can we be more aware understanding, inclusive, accessible to our marginalized, more marginalized students? And how do we develop that relationship needed to be able to truly understand and empathize with our students? Well, first of all, um, I don't think we can have these conversations with our students until we've had these conversations with ourselves. If we don't know where our implicit biases, you know, where it lives, where it thrives, where it lives, where it thrives, where it comes from. I think that first we have to be educated ourselves about how to educate that child. And we make a lot of assumptions about other. You know, other does not, because I'm a different color does not mean that I am always impoverished, that I have the worst set of circumstances. That's one of the, the tremendous mistakes that I see happening a lot. Mm. When people tell other people of color, oh, well, your story is different. Well, actually it's a lot. There are millions of us just like us. So mm. I, th I think that right now here we have a time where we're still, and there's so many opportunities throughout the state of North Carolina that you can tap into in terms of dismantling racism, in terms of how to teach, how to teach the, the diverse, how to create the diverse classroom, even when there is no diversity in your classroom, you can mm -hmm. still create a diverse curricular. You know, what are your materials? Where do they come from? Who's generating them? Who's mm -hmm. writing them? I want to give a shout out to Liberation Station Bookstore that has a, just an, an amazing array of books for all kinds of children. So it has a lot to do with instructional materials, how we work with those materials, I've seen materials that were supposed to address the very question that um, we were just asked. And instead it makes a mockery of diversity. So I think we have to be very, very, very careful. Um, but again, coming around to understanding the vernacular of certain communities, you know, and the values of that community, because what's What's a value in, in one set of circumstances is not a value in an, perhaps another set of circumstances or what, what someone may value for their child may not be what I value for my child. And I think we have to really make the effort and now is a good time to make the effort, um, you know, write more, ask parents to write about themselves, assign students assignments where they have to go through the neighborhood and gather interviews or just interview everyone in their home, including the pets and have <laughs> children write these stories. Mm. The more we know, the more we can see, as you said, the more we can see our children, the better we teach them. So I, I know I'm rambling a little bit, but, but I hope that that answered it, Bailey. Yeah. Well, these are delightful ramblings. So we appreciate your ramblings, great. <clears throat> Keith Lindsay has a question. He says, can you discuss your writing process. I think I think all of us are always um, uh, in wonder about the writing process. Does a line come to you and then you build the poem around it, or does an idea come to you and you wait for the poem to come from that idea? All of the above. Um, I'm going to show you a book that I wrote on my cell phone. Okay. Wow. What does it say? What? I want, I want to undie you. Oh, okay. 
poem that I wrote for my daughter. My daughter Imani died at the age of 38, 11 years ago in uh, 2009. And I wanted to write about her and it just was never coming. And this line, I want to undie you, started showing up every morning at four o'clock. And this is my process. It's a tremendous process for me and it works for me. I use my journals as bank accounts. I use my journals as bank accounts. I have journals everywhere in every room, every room in the house, on the porch, in my car, in other people's cars, uh, at other people's houses, vacation spots, but I have journals everywhere. So when those one-liners come or maybe one word come, or I hear a body of music that moves me or elicits <clears throat> language, I gather and make that deposit. I immediately make that one-liner into journals. So for this, for this, I wrote it on my cell phone because I was too lazy to get up and actually start writing or recording. So in my notes feature on my cell phone, I just started depositing, depositing, depositing. This poem was coming for weeks. It is a long one book poem that is inside of my cell phone that is now a published book. Wow. But at that moment, the cell phone became the journal. In 2006, I went to Central America to do a writing retreat. And I took with me about 12 journals that I had not looked in for a long time. And when I got there, I started looking through all the journals and they started communicating with each other. And journals that were five or six years old we were talking to journals that were one year old. And I came back, oh, I don't have it in front of me. I came back with my publication, a manuscript for Breath of the Song. Mm -hmm. So we are constantly making those one-liners or one paragraph because I am not the writer, have never been the writer that has the financial uh, broad whiff to take summers off or take sabbaticals and write for a year. I've always had to be the working class writer, artist, and I'm better for it. But I'm saying this because we have to capture those lines. You gotta put them somewhere or you lose them. You're not going to remember them. Mm -hmm. When I travel to the beach, I'm constantly making notes of names of churches, names of rivers, names of towns I've never heard of before. All of those names start talking to each other. You know, some are like really funny names or quirky names or names that I come back and do research and find that, you know, it's a Native American word. Um, so make sure that you're, you have a depository hmm. because when you have all of that money in the bank and you have that two month sabbatical where you can actually, as I do, go to Morocco and hunker down and write for two months, you have your commerce with you and you start making those withdrawals. So that's how I use my journals. Um, because I write a lot about what's happening socially, commercially, mm -hmm. commercially, politically. Um, I'm, I'm always having, there, there's no loss of inspiration. Right. You know, we have um, a new superintendent elect, Catherine uh, Truitt, who will become our superintendent in um, January. I was wondering, you, you have a message for our teachers and for us as educators. Do you have a message for policymakers? What should, what should um, Catherine Truitt focus on at the very beginning? Wow. Well, <laughs> funny you ask, because I've been thinking about this a, a lot. And I actually wrote out what I was thinking. Um, you know, right now, how do we move forward engaging competency-based approaches to assessment uh, that reward a broad de definition of growth? You know, the key is innovation. Um, I, I don't think that we can continue to rely on a system that does not serve all of our children to, to excel at their fullest potential. So I think that as an administrator, I would hope that She's looking at how the stresses on teachers might be affecting their students mm -hmm. and how, how would she help teachers to adapt to all of these new roles? They're now 
They have multi roles. They're, they become learning navigators. You know, it, it must be very stressful to be an in room, in classroom, you know, bouncing back and forth as some counties are. Um, but how do we explore the multi literacies of children? You know, what does it mean to be literate in the 21st century? Um, and I think we need to un expand. I think her role could help expand mm -hmm. that question. What does it mean to be literate in the 21st century? Not replacing traditional learning, but expanding on exploring those multi-literacies. What we have done is kind of siloed our children in terms of, of educational excellence. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to re-engage that. I think that she, not only she, but all of us have to think about the role of the community, the role of the artists. Uh, I'm proud of those parents who've been talking to me, who've been saying, you know, I'm spending more time walking in the woods with my child. And we're not talking about the language problems he couldn't answer this morning. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the woods and how do we find the literacy inside of our natural world right now to help our children understand. Yeah. I think the more that we understand, the more we empower them and enable them to be better citizens, better caretakers. You know, I believe, like I said before, that we have a rich opportunity through this portal, you know, life after COVID. Right. After COVID. And how do we reimagine ourselves as better people? Because we've got to do better. We've got to do better by our children. Don't do better by me. Do better by our children and speak the truth to them. Take the risk of speaking the truth. And that risk will serve us best. And I think that administrators have to take the risk. Mm -hmm. They have to know their communities. They have to know who they're serving. They have to listen. They have to listen compassionately. And not only listen, but then translate what they hear into practicum. And I think that's that's the, be that's the best way to show up in this paradigm right now. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, our, our time is coming to an end. This has been uh, a joyous conversation for me. And it's amazing how quickly an hour goes by. But thank you for sharing your poetry and your insights. And many thanks to our audience for tuning in. You reminded us, Jackie, at the beginning of the session that poetry is an act of revolution. Pablo Narada said, poetry is also an act of peace. Thank you, Jackie Shelton Green, North Carolina Poet Laureate. Thank you for your words and actions towards revolution and peace as our North Carolina Poet Laureate. Everyone thank take care and thank you so much for joining us. We'll stay on just a minute, Jackie, if you have time. Sure. Thank you. <clears throat>